Welcome to all of you who are joining us online this morning. It's uh, great to have you with us as well. Uh, we finish up our lesson series this morning regarding the sword of the Lord. Fittingly enough, it's called the conclusion of the matter. So we'll be talking about, uh, actually, if you want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles, the scriptures will be up on the screen, but uh, those of you at the back, because we pinched some of this into a font that you may have a hard time reading, Revelation 19 is going to be our, where we're going to be in our first scripture this morning, but it's going to be a little while before we get there. The conclusion of the matter. There's an old familiar saying, and I want you to help me finish it, okay? There's a very familiar saying that says there are only two sure things in life. What did you say? Death and taxes. Well, some of us are struggling through that taxes thing right now. <laughs> but we're, we're still amongst us here as far as the part of the living. But you know, uh, that's kind of a, it's one of those cliche sayings that... Uh, we just kind of take for granted, and it has a little bit of dark humor to it. It does speak a thread of tr truth. But you know, believers, the Lord's people, know much more about certainty, sure things, than what that statement implies. You know that? We know much more about certainty than what that says, about death and taxes. We know now faith which we have. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we cannot see. Right? Okay, got to train some of you. This is yes. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we cannot see. We know and believe through our faith about eventualities for us that are inevitable inescapable. We're not going to go around them. There are certain things that we know because we are people of the Word and we're God's people. There are certain things that we know that are in front of us out there. Do we not? But the world that we live in doesn't seem to calibrate the same way that we do. It doesn't seem to calibrate on the facts of eventualities and inescapabilities that we're going to run into. They don't believe some of these things. It doesn't seem because as we've seen over the last number of years and have for a long time, a lot of our world is involved in things that really doesn't comport with being a spiritual person or a believer. People in a world of rebellion and selfishness and self-centeredness and working on things that eternally are not really going to make all that much difference, it would appear that they don't calibrate on the same facts that we do. No, it's not going on for the rest of the class. It's going to end. The heartbeat for each of us will end. And then we must be prepared for that eventuality that we're talking about. You know that? That inescapability? We've been talking about here in this series about the sword of the Lord, about how it has to do with God's will and His word and His way. There are many people that surround us that have, haven't come to grips with that. And knowing that they are finite. Lord's people know that they're finite and that we're marching to Zion. We're going someplace else. You know, we sing those songs. We're marching to Zion. To Canaan's land, I'm on my way. That's where we're headed. But there's a lot of people that don't believe this either, that this is going to end.
we've studied in this class and said from the scripture it basically says from what Peter told us that a thousand years is as a day to the Lord. A day is as a thousand years, right? We deal with a God who is eternal, eternally powerful, eternally perfect, eternally holy, one who is from everlasting to everlasting, as we will see in some of the scriptures this morning. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He sees the end just like he sees the beginning. Time is a human function, do you know that? How we mark time. Now God gave us seasons and he gave us things in the eternal heavens to be able to look at and to mark the seasons and the years. But as far as time is concerned, that is something that we've measured. And the thing of it is that our lives are measured there is an end that will happen. Everybody in here knows that, right? Shake your head up and down. Yes, okay, good. We sing songs about it. On that bright and cloudless morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder, what? You and I will be there. There's another song that we sing, not very much because it's so old and Sonny would tell us that, uh, you know, this one goes back so far that we just don't sing it, but we also sing this one. There's a great day coming. A great day coming, there's a great day coming by and by. When the saints and the sinners shall be parted right and left. Are you ready for that day to come? Some of these events that we're going to look at in the book of Revelation, I don't know how many of that we'll get to see. But there's one thing for certain that the events that are going to unfold during judgment, we all should be concerned with. And we should all believe what the vision that the Apostle John saw on the island of Patmos is true. But then again, we might get to see some of these events. And here at the end of Revelation, we see the final numbers of the sword of the Lord come into play. One of them we'll be seeing in this first reading. There's this scene. Revelation 19. Doug, read to us. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. Then I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. 
The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. This rider on this horse, portrayed here, who is that? King of kings and Lord of lords will ride in this time of judgment. We see here that he is known as the word of God. It harkens us back to what John told us that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And even so we see it here at the end of times. Jesus coming and the word is basically conquering evil and judging evil and judging the things that have happened down through the millennia. Nathan gave a lesson, I think it was last Sunday evening, about uh, the things that are going to be thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. Here we see evil, we see Satan himself and his minions that are going to be thrown into this lake of burning sulfur. And those that followed the works of evil and the works of Satan, the sword takes them out in the end. So the first step that we see here as far as judgment is concerned, although much of it has already been determined by their actions or their inactions, as, as the case may be, there is a determined, inescapable place where evil is going to be put. In a minute we're going to see that it's called the, the, the second death. So then we see a next step in Revelation 21. We see that there is a new heaven and a new earth that's been created. Doug, Revelation 21, 1 through 8. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. So the fourth week we had the story of, of Genesis chapter 3, the expulsion from the garden. Adam and Eve were expulsed from the garden for a very, very poignant reason, were they not? It was because they'd made a choice. They made a choice to rebel. They made a choice to sin. And they were expulsed from the garden. And we saw that that tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil and all of the wonderful things that happened in paradise 
were cut off and they were sent from the garden and the sword flashing back and forth guarded the way to that garden. What Doug just read to us is the opening once again of paradise where those who have been obedient and faithful will be allowed to go back into paradise. Don't you long for that place where there will be no more suffering? And where God will wipe every tear from our eyes? No more sickness. No more of all the bad things that we've seen here on this earth. We look forward to that time. To the thirsty, those who basically long for righteousness, and put themselves in faithfulness and obedience. The thirsty, those who are thirsty for righteousness, for God's righteousness, will be there. And these other folks, these other folks that have made the choice to dwell in evil for most of their lives, guess what? There's a hot place waiting for them, like Nathan described to us, in a really stinky place. Second death. So then we see the next part of this story in Revelation 22, 1 through 5. We actually see Eden restored. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of the lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. So there will be no more curse. What is that curse? The sin, that that's against God, that missed the mark, and death that accompanies it. We're told in Romans, are we not? The wages of sin is what? Death. That tells us the story. There won't be any more of that. Should have gotten an amen there. <laughs> Hallelujah. It won't be, there won't be any more of that in, in, at this time. And then we have the Lord's invitation, Revelation 22, 12 through 17. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. Where did this Heath candy bar come from? <laughs> so 
somebody did that to me. Because <laughs> that's my favorite candy bar. I'll find out who. So the Lord says, my reward is with me. And I will give... Is there anything that's unclear here? My reward is with me. And I will give to each person according to what they have done. Is there anything unclear about that? Blessed are those who wash their robes. We've talked about this since the beginning of the lesson series. Blessed are those who wash their robes, who get themselves cleaned up, just like those ancient Jews did before they went and presented themselves in the temple before the Lord. Just as we read all of the different scenarios in the Old Testament where people, as they were to meet with God, were expected to get themselves cleaned up. We need to have white robes to get there, folks. And in case this is unclear to anyone who may be listening online or whatever, the way that you get your robes cleaned up is first of all in obedience, in faithful obedience and baptism, you come to the Lord and you clean your robes. That's what this is talking about. You clean your robes. You get cleaned up. And then, as Ken told us so many times, you walk in sanctity, you walk in holiness, and keep yourself cleaned up to get ready to go to heaven. I don't know how much this that we'll physically see. I suspect quite a bit of it. When we pass out of this life, the time for faithfulness is over. We had a chance at obedience and faithfulness in this life. What will happen past that point is inescapable. It's inevitable. It will happen. And we will see the Lord. And as he's told us, he has a reward for those who've been faithful. For those who have, been, who have not been faithful, they're going to get a reward, but not one that's pleasant. So we want to make some application regarding what we've discussed here today. And the application is simply that we're going to review what we've been through in this course already. If we have time. Oh, we do. We'd have, we're done good. So we made an introduction to the class and talked about the essence of the sword as you see it applied across all of these many scriptures and many that we did not get to in the Bible. It's about the who. It's about the creator, the almighty God. It's about his will and his word and his way that he's dictated for his creation, his people to follow. The next lesson that we did was who's in charge here? It was about the concept of authority that you may recall. And we outlined why God Almighty, the eternal creator, has every right. He owns it all. He made it. He owns it all. He has the right to have ultimate authority in the universe and in the workings of mankind. March 28th, we had a lesson called Ain't Scared. Well, we talked about a healthy fear of God. The concept of the fear of God about because if we realize who he is and what he controls and the ultimate consequences, we should fear, fear God. And then in Love Makes the World Go Round, we looked at the biblical concept of the love of God. The actual meaning of the Hebraic word and the Greek word that means what we refer to as agape, which is simply giving oneself up. That's what God did for his creation. He gave himself up so far in the fact that he gave his only son. He gave up in an example of what we should follow as far as agape is concerned. Giving oneself up. Even to the detriment of self for other people. Rebel Without a Cause, April 4th, we talked about the biblical concept of lawlessness. It was talking about an attitude of rebellion. An attitude of rebellion against God. 
it has cursed mankind since the beginning, much of mankind, that there is and can be an inherent rebellion against God. In Lost Will and Testament in Genesis 2 and 3, we looked at the consequences of sin and judgment as Adam and Eve were sent from the Garden of Eden. On April 25th, warning don't walk, we looked at the commands of God through Moses, the choice of obedience and disobedience. On May 2nd, it was Get Smart meets Mr. Ed. That was a lesson in Numbers 22, talking about the intolerance of God towards spiritual flip-floppers. May 9th, gymnastics meet, we looked at the episode involving Jericho. Victory for God's people when they follow directions exactly as they have been given. On May 16th, it was, is that you or your ego in 1 Chronicles 21? It was David's choice due to pride and the consequential catastrophe that followed based upon a shepherd and a leader not following the will of God. In Go Figure on May 23rd, we took a step back and we looked at the example of Mary about how the will of God and the, the faithful don't always seem to equate and to be something that we understand totally, that those who follow may be in the will of God. And we talked about how Mary was caught up in the project of constructing that way of holiness through her son. Second part of that lesson was no Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, no peace. And that was the lesson about how the word, indicated as a sword, creates separation between those who are obedient and followers of Jesus and those who are not. And today we talked about judgment and about evil destroyed and eternal bliss for the obedient and faithful. Faithful believers have a prescribed destiny. It's been written so that we can understand it and believe it and change maybe the way that we order our lives. Faithful believers have a prescribed destiny. So do non-believers. This lesson series, The Sword of the Lord, has been constructed and communicated to impart Bible teaching about God's inherent nature, His will, His word, and His way, and to articulate the Bible's message about God's eternal justice. Victory and reward for the faithful, defeat and punishment for the disobe disobedient and sinful. As we have seen, there are multiple instances spanning Genesis through Revelation, where the sword of the Lord is operative in the discourses with divine intervention and judgment. The hope for you from this teacher is twofold. One, that this study has influenced and convinced you even more so to walk obediently and faithfully before and with the Lord. And two, to ascertain more knowledge to equip us to be able to persuade others, that would be our neighbors, our friends, our acquaintances, and our family, about the eternal, inescapable consequences of being a Christian or not. If a church person chooses to be an unbeliever, as we have said since the onset of this class, then a person should be aware of the consequences. Hebrews 10.31 says, It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God for an unbeliever. An unbeliever will confront the sword of the Lord at judgment. He gave us his word. Thank you.